أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين وأفضل الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الخلق والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين المؤيد أحمد أمجد أبو القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين واللعنة الدائمة السرمدية الأبدية على أعدائهم إلى قيام يوم الدين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد في الأولين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد في الآخرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد في الملأ الأعلى اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم والحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي أمير المؤمنين مولى الموحدين إمام المتقين الصديق الأكبر فاروق هذه الأمة أسد الله الغالب غالب كل غالب علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا أن نهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الحكيم وهو أصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم محمد رسول الله والذين معه أشداء على الكفار رحماء بينهم تراهم ركعا سجدا يبتقون فضلا من الله ورضوانا The famous uh, Arab poet Muhammad al-Harzi he states in a poem he says أهل بيت طهروا من دنس وهم في الخلق أسباب النجاة أهل بيت طهروا من دنس وهم في الخلق أسباب النجاة رؤساء الدين أقطاب الهدى ولهم في الحشر أسمى الدرجات وإذا ما ذكروا في مجلس كانت الأملاك فيه نازلات وليمحى كل ذنب عندنا ارفعوا أصواتكم بالصلوات I greet you all with the Islamic greeting Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh The Sahaba of Rasulullah The companions of the Messenger of Allah Without a shadow of a doubt, they are the most important generation in Islamic history. For they are the ones that met Rasulullah, saw Rasulullah, spoke to Rasulullah, interacted with Rasulullah, ate with Rasulullah, protected Rasulullah, loved Rasulullah. They are the first to hear the message of Rasulullah. They are the first to narrate. The Quran, they are the ones that narrated the Quran to us. They are the ones that allowed Islam to flourish. Now, without a doubt, the Sahaba of Rasulullah, especially when it comes to Sunni Shia polemics, it becomes somewhat controversial. Feelings are hurt, um, emotions get involved. But inshallah ta'ala, the speech today is more to do um, with delving into a primary question, two primary questions. Question one is, how do the Shia conclude, what is the mechanism, let's say, when they conclude regarding a Sahabi? How do they say, for example, this Sahabi is good, this Sahabi is bad. This Sahabi, we take from this Sahabi, we don't. And what is the way that the Shias throughout history did this? How did they deal with the Sahaba of Rasulullah? The second important point that we want to discuss also is what is the general understanding of the Sahaba 
in the Hadith corpus, in the Shia Hadith corpus. Now, it's important to understand a crucial point. We as Shia have done great injustice to the Sahaba of Rasulullah. I think we have to accept that. We probably only know about four or five, you know, Salman, Ammar, Miqdad, Abu Dhar, you know, Jabir bin Abdullah al-Ansari, because, you know, in the length, uh, the lengthy Hadith al-Kisa, he's the one that narrates it, because we hear it all the time in Majalis. We've done injustice to them, and we haven't studied their biography. I say, after studying the biography of the Prophet and the Imams, and the rest of the Prophets, of course, as well, they are the most important individuals to study. Why? Because when it comes to the Sahaba of Rasulullah, the Sahaba of Rasulullah are the ones that will tell us certain aspects, elements, and different dynamics of the Prophet's um, personality. Because they are the ones that interacted with him, right? So they are the ones that will give us a better picture about the Prophet. In our pulpits, what we see is, a lot of the time we always hear, I'm sure everyone's heard it, that if it wasn't for the money of Khadija, alayhi salam, and the sword of Amir al-Mu'mineen, there would be no Islam. True. I don't think history can deny that. We don't deny that. But we, we seem to forget to mention that in the Battle of Badr, it's famously usually mentioned on our pulpits, is that 70 of the kuffar got killed on that day. 35 of them, Amir al muminin killed. Who do you think killed the other 35? It was the Sahaba of Rasulullah. When we look at all the other battles, who are the ones that were there protecting Rasulullah? The Sahaba. Yes, in some battles, they fled, some of them. Yes, we as Shia have a certain negative or we dissociate from certain companions. There's no doubt about that. We're not here to deny that. But it's important for theology to reflect history, and history to reflect our theology. Because if, if it doesn't, what happens is, is you start to think, who's made it up? For example, in recent years, after some reading, I concluded that um, some of the, under, the understanding, the current understanding of Esma, infallibility of the Imams, is not exactly how it's portrayed. Why? I don't want to delve too much into it, but it's just a small point. Because when you study their seerah, because if we look at the way that our Shia look at the infallibility of the Imams, we look at it in a very robotic way. And if we're going to look at it in a robotic way, the Imams alayhum salam will just all be one. you got Imam al kazim who will act exactly the same way as Imam al-Sadiq. Imam al-Sadiq will act exactly the same way as Imam al-Baqir. And that's not reality at all. Actually, they like different things. They were normal human beings. And our classical scholars didn't have this understanding of infallibility. Now, just to get back to the main point, I will just mention this so we can kind of put one and one together. So we can understand exactly what I'm trying to say, that history and theology needs to be one. So when we look at, for example, other aspects, when we look at certain personalities of the Sahaba that the Shias do not revere, do not respect. For example, Khalid bin Walid. When you come forward and you hear, for example, you say, Khalid bin Walid was a successful commander. She has, we, she has, we can't no, 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 that's not how it is. No, I mean, look at his resume. You know, sometimes when you, <laughs> I don't know if the Shabab watch it, but you, when you look at like boxers or UFC fighters, you want to see, oh, how many times has he been defeated? How many KOs he's got? Go and look at his resume, Khalid bin Walid. He was a warrior. There's no doubt. He was a very successful, he's probably the, one of the most successful soldiers, warriors of, you know, the Islam that he followed. There's no doubt about it. We can't, it's not something we can reject. But we can't accept that. What we've done is, 
is we've done this kind of Hollywood effect. You know that Avengers versus Thanos, but it's not like that. It's really not like that. It's it wasn't just how you see your day to day life. It's just normal, average. That's how it is. Yes, this person did an evil act. Finished. I had a, a Sunni friend of mine a few years ago. There's a famous story that's mentioned. I'm paraphrasing uh, right now because I don't know. I can't remember the exact story in detail how it was, how it is in the books. But it says when Omar bin al Khattab entered Jerusalem, he was seen under a palm tree eating dates, and they were shocked that this is the Khalifa of the Muslims. So I said that, so my friend was saying it to me to show like how humble Umar bin al-Khattab was. So I said to him, I said to him, look, I mean, I'm pretty sure he probably did. You know, he had a few dates under a palm tree, that's, that's okay. But I mean, he does come from the Arabian Peninsula, it's a normal thing. This is his average lifestyle. He would sit down under a palm tree eating dates. It's probably hot, so he wanted a bit of shadow. What's the problem? But Ashia was like, no, 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 it's probably a lie. No, it's fine. I'll accept it, it's fine. He's a normal human being, sat under a palm tree. He wanted to shout it, ate a bit of dates, finished, end of story. So we need to look at, we need to kind of leave that um, Thanos versus Avengers kind of life, that, that look into history. We've made history, a lot of us, I feel as Shia, it's like a fairy tale, it's become like a fairy tale. It isn't. It's a world of realities. Imam Ali didn't go like that and then 300 men just fell with his sword. That's not how it happened. He fought. He got injured. We have a hadith where Zahra alayhi salam would, um, you know, um, when he comes back from war, she would try to heal him with, you know, different medication that they had at the time and so on. All of these factors. Yes, there was a miracles that happened, but it wasn't just a thing where it was, you know, the way that some of us make, I've seen some things on the pulpit, you're thinking, I mean, did he watch 300 before he came to give a speech? I don't know. But generally speaking, what we want to do is we want to focus on the Sahaba. Um, and we'll go through different narrations and we'll try to look at these different narrations, different aspects, and look what the um, scholars said. So there's a really important hadith in a book called Rijal al-Najashi or Fahrist al-Najashi. It's a book of Rijal, um, a book that basically its whole... Um, Objective is to look at the chain of narrators, authentic, not authentic, and so on. So he narrates from his chain, and he narrates from a companion by the name of Abdul Rahman bin al Hajjaj, companion of Imam al Sadiq. Now, this, is, this hadith is going to give us, this narration, sorry, this report is going to give us an overview of how our early predecessors, our Salaf al Salih, looked at this whole discussion regarding the Sahaba of Rasulullah. He says, we were, in, we were in Aban bin Taghlib's gathering, and a young man came to him and said, Oh Aba Sa'id, that was his kunya, his title. He said, Oh Aba Sa'id, inform me, how many people took part with Ali bin Abi Talib from amongst the Prophet's companions? He's asking him a question, how many people participated with Amir al-Mu'mineen in his battles? Um, Jamal, Nahrawan, Safin. Yeah? Aban says, by the way, Aban, this personality, he's a companion of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. He is of the theologians, the mutakallim, the fuqaha. He is one of the greatest companions of Imam al-Sadiq. Even the Sunnis, when they discuss him, they would, they would talk about how great of a scholar he was. So he said, Aban said to him, it is as if you wish to know the greatness of Ali by the mere fact of those that followed him from the companions of the Messenger of Allah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So he says, so he says to him, it's as if you wish to know the greatness of Ali by the mere fact of those that followed him from the companions of the Messenger of Allah. It's a good question, right? So the young man said, it is as, as you say. So it's true what you're saying. So he, Aban, by Allah, 
We did not know their virtue except by their following of him. So this companion of Imam al-Sadiq and the way that he's viewing things, he's saying, no, no, you've got it wrong, young man. It's not, that's not how we're looking at it. We're saying, we only knew how great they are by following Ali. And this is a qa'ida, this is a principle that I was talking about. How do we examine the Sahaba of Rasulullah? This is the main factor. This is the foundation of the discussion. Ali bin Abi Talib. Is that we see how did they interact with Amir al-Mu'mineen? How did they in, um, aid Amir al-Mu'mineen, support Amir al-Mu'mineen? Then it says, a, a contemporary of um, Abam bin Taghlib, he says, Abu Bilad, he says, it is better for a man in the furthest land and the nearest and the near most ones for them not to fall into tragedy or fall into trials and tribulations that does not enter upon him. So he's basically saying, and the reason why the translation is a bit difficult to translate is because there were certain words that were used that was probably not... Um, best that I've translated literally. So that's why I tried to kind of give it in the best way possible. So he's basically saying, if you don't feel some type of sadness for this great man, Abam bin Taghlib, then basically you're the furthest away. So he said, Aban told him, oh, Abba Bilad, do you know whom the Shia are? Listen to this. Whenever someone says to you, who are the Shia? This is the reply you give them. He says, the Shia are those who follow the opinion of Ali when quotations from the Prophet contradict. I'll repeat it again. The Shia are those who follow the opinion of Ali when the quotations from the Prophet contradict. And the opinion of Ja'far bin Muhammad, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, when quotations from Ali are contradictory. When someone asks you, who are you as a Shia? This is the reply you give them. You give them the reply of Abam bin Taghlib. That we are the Shia. We follow, we follow Amir al-Mu'mineen when the ahadith between the Sahaba contradict. And we take from who? Ali. Because he's Sirat al-Mustaqeen. And then when the quotations of Amir al-Mu'mineen contradict, we take the words of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Have you realized how Abam bin Taghlib didn't say, he didn't say um, that, oh, the Sahaba lied here or that. No, they contradicted and we'll, we'll start to understand why they contradicted. There's certain contradictory ahadith because these personalities, what they did was, so for example, in the night, they'll come to Rasulullah, he'll give them a fatwa. In the morning, that fatwa might have changed. But that person's already gone back to Yemen. So the fatwa and the quotations might contradict because of that. We see also a scholar by the name of Lester Abadi. He's usually famously known for to be Akhbari, the Akhbari school of thought. He says, and this is a very crucial point that he says, he says a lot of issues that are in the early age of Islam were from the daruriyat, I'll explain that in a second, of the religion, then became nadari in later generations because, the com because of the confusion that occurred and the deceptions that surfaced. An example of this is the caliphate of the commander of the faithful, alayhi salam. So daruriyat means it's the fundamental beliefs. Why? It's not like now. It's, for example, now, Someone that's not that's a non-Shia, he has to go through so much, you know, misconceptions, refutations, arguments for him to get to the truth about Amir al-Mu'mineen. But at that time, there's not we don't believe that. As Shia, we don't see it as no, we say Rasulullah was clear cut. My Khalifa is Ali bin Abi Talib. And so anyone that contradicts that and shows that he's contradicted it, 
and I'll explain that in a second, is, is that he's gone against the fundamentals. Because it's like when the Prophet وسلم, says, you have to believe in this specific thing. And then if you turn around and say, no, I don't believe in it. You're a kafir. It's straight away. There's no two ways. Because Rasulullah said it and you heard him. So that generation lived in the time of Rasulullah. So Nadari means it became more, more or less uh, a theory. So later on, for example, it's, no, but I heard from, for example, the second generation after the companions, the Tabi'een. He would say, no, but I heard this companion say this, who he said that Rasulullah said that. And then, and then now there's a lot of smoke b- between you and the truth. It's difficult to get to. It's not as easy as just, I heard Rasulullah and it's finished. So he continues this scholar. He says, what sheds light on the truth of this position is that, is what has come in the widely, so the Tawatur, reports from the pure Imams dividing the people after him. So the widely narrated reports. Tawatur, meaning many different narrations, uh, from Rasulullah, all, all different companions narrating these specific narrations. So widely uh, reported, um, widely reported um, reports from the pure Imam dividing the people after them. So he's saying the the Imam divided the people in the time of Rasulullah. So after the Prophet, as Mu'minin and Murtadin, believers and apostates. So he's saying there is a the imams didn't differentiate between the two. No, sorry, they differentiated only with these two. Mu'min, apostate. Nothing more, nothing less. Then he continues, and the division of the later generations into believer, val, misguided, or nasibi, hater, without mentioning irtidad, apostasy. So the imams, he's saying, when it came to the first generation, the sahaba, the only difference was they put them two categories. Believer, Murtad. That's it. And then for the later generations, it was Mu'min, Misguided, or Nasabi. Now, if I'm totally honest with you, I don't fully agree with what he's saying because we do have a hadith where the Imams, alayhum salam do not call um, you know, someone that, for example, didn't aid the Prophet, uh, the Imam alayhi salam, or anything like that as just murtad. It wasn't like that. And we'll see a narration that highlights and represents uh, what I'm saying. Also Sayyid al-Khumaini, he says, it is also possible to say the fundamental belief of Imama was in the first generation of, uh, among the Dharuriyat of Islam. So it was from the fundamentals of Islam. Now someone can ask, does the Sayyid mean that it's not from the fundamentals now? No. What he's trying to say is, is at that period, you don't believe in the Imam of Amir al muminin you're a kafir. Straight. Finished. End of story. Now we're going to get into that specific um, point of, oh, kafir just like that? Or is there a bit of a discussion? We'll get into that in a second. So the, the Ruriyat of Islam... And the um, first generation who rejected the imama of the Mawla, the commander of the faithful, and the Nas, so the designation of the Messenger of Allah concerning his Khilafah and deputyship, were rejecting a Dharuri without being a credible excuse from their like, especially the people of Halli wal Aqd, so the elite ones, so those that were from the jurists among the Sahaba, those that were people of knowledge of the Sahaba. So he's basically saying, the Nas was clear. The, khil- the Khalifa after me is Ali bin Abi Talib. So anything that these, that first generation reject, kafir, straight away. Then he continues. Then doubt arose for later generations. This is important. Because of the excessive trust that they had in the first generation. If you look at Ahl Sunnah, they'll tell you that the Sahaba would never lie. They would never lie against Rasulullah. All of them are good. All of them are believers. All of them were upon goodness. So he says, the doubt arose for later generations because of the excessive trust that they had for the first generation. 
not being able to entertain the possibility that they could have purposely disobeyed the instructions of the Messenger of Allah and his nas, so his designation of Amir al Mu'mineen, and the uh, of the Mawla, so the nas of the Mawla, and disregarding the possibility of such a large crowd having forgotten or overlooked that instruction. See, that last part is important. That's when we're going to start to look at, okay, sure, at the fundamental level, the first generation that reject the Khilaf of Amir al Mu'mineen, Kafir. But then afterwards, okay, is there a certain understanding of before we actually declare Kafir or Murtad or hypocrite or something along them lines? We'll get into that. So he says, and then he continues, Sayyid Khomeini, he says, perhaps. This is perhaps this is this that this was what was mentioned is the secret behind what has come of the apostasy of the people after the messenger of Allah except four or less or more. It is clear that it is not apostasy of all the people, be they pre present in the land of revelation or not, that is meant. I'll explain that in a second. Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So, about two years ago, I gave a lecture by the name of The Final Cut, The Companions of the Prophet in Shia Thought. You can find it on YouTube. What I did in that lecture, my whole focus was on um, an argument that's been in the books of Ahl Sunnah, probably from the second, third generation. I've seen even Ahmed bin Hanbal say it, who's from the third uh, generation the third century of scholars. Now he, what he mentions, and what many of the Ahlul Sunnah, they say that the Shias believe all of the Sahaba, the thousands and thousands of Sahaba, all became Murtaddin, they apostated, except three, four or five. And what's interesting is that we actually have quite a lot of Ahadith, more or less alluding to that, in our books. So what I did was in that lecture, I gathered everything, I gathered all of these reports, and I explained one by one, and we started to go through them, where I showed that, no, this, the irtidad here, the apostasy here, doesn't mean irtidad that they left the religion. Rather, it meant that they, they believed, many of them in the Khilaf of Amir al-Mu'mineen, but they betrayed the allegiance, the allegiance to Amir al Mu'mineen because he said to them, Come and meet me in the afternoon, and we'll basically go to war and take over the Khilafah after Abu Bakr took the caliphate in, in Saqifah. So that's what Sayyid Khomeini is saying here. Now, this is where it gets a bit more detailed. Um, a scholar by the name of Sheikh Asif Muhsini, um, he has a book called Bahuth fi Ilm al Rijal. It's a book about the study of the narrators of hadith. But he, in his fifth edition, he added another chapter where he basically discussed the companions of the Prophet. Now, he gives a really important um, breakdown of the different categories of the Sahaba. Look how important this is. And now this is when we're get, getting into, okay, so is it just kafir straight away like that? This is what he discusses. Whoever heard the Nas, so the designation from Rasulullah, understood what was intended, then opposed it through action and belief. So that's category one. He's saying, whoever heard the Nas, understood what was intended, then opposed it through action and belief. So he heard Ghadir, he heard all the other narrations, but then he rejected it through action and belief. Because Iman is what? Action and belief. The second one, whoever heard the Nas understood what was intended, then opposed it through their actions, but not by belief. So this person will be what? A mu'min. The third one, whoever heard it and embraced it through their belief and actions. Mu'min, definitely. 
who, the fourth one, whoever heard it and did not understand the intended meaning. This is a crucial one. The fifth one, who did not hear it from the beginning, not in Medina and not in Ghadir Khum, after Hajjat al Wada, so after the last pilgrimage, and complete and the complete authoritative proof was not put forth to them. So these proofs didn't get to them. That's what he's saying. Number six, whoever returned back to the Nas, so came back after he rejected, after the period, the period of, uh, he basically saying, the period is, he's talking about the time of the Shaykhain, Abu Bakr and Umar. Or in the time of his caliphate, after the killing of Uthman, or even fought under his brigade in Basra, Safrin, or Naharawan. That's six. Seven, from those who witnessed it and died before the demise of the Messenger of Allah. This is very crucial. And we, we have to explain each one. So, so whoever heard the Nas understood what was inten, in, intended, then opposed it through action and belief. Murtad. We're done with him. But the crucial point here is how many of how many of the companions of Rasulullah can we prove fell into this? Not many. Are you understanding my point? So what I'm saying is, and what Sheikh Asif Muhsini is saying, he's saying, okay, so there's seven categories. The first one, they opposed it through action and belief. Okay, how can we prove it? Majority of them, we can't prove it. So the scholars or the speakers, the Shia scholars or the Shia speakers, and I've heard it. Believe me, I've heard it. I rem- you know, it's, it's a funny story. I, um, who remembers when there was that controversy that happened with Basim al karbalai He basically, I think it was last year, he was like, he was doing a Latmiya on Fatimiya. And then he goes, something, he calls the Sahaba uh, Asaba, a gang. And then, you know, there was a big uproar, you know, you're causing fitna, don't say that. And I was sitting with the elders of the community and, you know, they're talking among themselves. Oh, did you see what he did? This It was a big thing in Iraq. And, you know, my father was there and a few of the uncles were there. And, um, and you know, they were like, yeah, yeah, it's their, it's their sahaba. Why? This is our sahaba. We love them. They've got this understanding, the older generation, especially, I've seen it, um, they actually think most of the Sahaba are, are bad. Yeah, they're Sahaba. Just like that. This is, this is the mentality that they have. We can't even prove. There's only probably a handful that we can prove that fall into the first category, which is that they opposed it through action and belief. Only a handful. Because when you look at the history, you've got a, a companion. He narrates from Rasulullah. We only know a few narrations from him. We don't know if he opposed Amir al mumni or not. So you can't say he's a murtad. You can't say he's a kafir. You can't say he's a munafiq. Is everyone with me? Are we understanding everything? Yeah? Second one. Whoever heard the Nas, understood what was intended, then opposed it through actions, but not belief. So that would, that would be... This can be proven that, yes, a bigger percentage of the Sahaba fall into this category. We have the narration that says, Amir al muminin came in Dhuhr time. And he basically said, meet me in the afternoon time with your heads shaved and come to me. We're going to revolt. Only um, Salman, Ammar and Abidhar came. And then, um, uh, sorry, Miqdad. Uh, Salman and Abi Dhar and then Ammar came later on and it said that um, in some reports other companions from the Muhajirin and Ansar came but they came too late so and we see there's a famous report in uh, Al-Khisal by Al-Saduq where it talks about 12 companions that opposed Abu Bakr they were telling him no the Khilaf is for Amir al muminin by the way there's there's a really really interesting reports that not many people have highlighted is a lot of people think okay so we Shia believe in the event of the door 
Or even let's say if you're from the Shia that don't believe in it, but you accept as it's, it's become more or less a historical fact that they came to attack the house. They came to threaten the house. We say there's actually reports where it says a tribe, like I think they were a Bedouin tribe, they came and basically took over the whole of Medina. And this is why some of the Sahaba were basically imprisoned to a certain degree. And many of them were in with who? Um, the army of Osama. They were going to battle and many of them left with him. In, I'm sure you've heard um, on our pulpits, is mentioned a lot, is where basically the Prophet said, you know, everyone needs to go with Osama, whoever doesn't go is basically disobeying me and so on. So many of the companions weren't there. So it was a perfect opportunity for the Khilafah to be taken. So many of them fall into category two, but it still means they're believers. Category three, whoever heard it and embraced it through their belief and actions. There's a, I wouldn't say a, a big percentage, but there is a, a good amount that, that will fall into category three. Why am I saying all of this stuff? Is because when we investigate the Sahaba, it's important that we don't look at all of them in one view. It's very important. So, category five, who did not hear it from the beginning, not in Medina and not in Ghadir Khum after Hajjat al Wada, and the complete authoritative proof was not put forth to them. Because you had companions from different lands, Yemen, um, from the outskirts of Medina, and so on. So, it wasn't always the case where they heard everything. Sometimes they would come, meet the Prophet. For a day or two and leave. This happens. So another big percentage of the Sahaba will go into category five. Category six, whoever returned back to the Nas after the period or in the time of his caliphate after the killing of Uthman or even fought under his brigade in Basra, Safin and Nahrawan. This is important as well. Because even if we used to say in the beginning there's sufficient proof that this group of companions through their actions and belief um, rejected the Nas but if we, if we have enough proof to say that they was in Basra Safin then, then we can put them at a um, that we can there could be a, a better argument to say that they fall into Iman now again did all of them believe in the caliphate of Amir al-Mu'mineen from the Sahaba were talking, there's a discussion. Um, from those who witnessed it and died before the demise of the Messenger of Allah. This is an important one. Why are these companions not being mentioned? Do you know how many stories there are? Do you know what they went through so that Islam gets to us? It's so important that we study these personalities. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran that we should have tarahum, make, make dua for those that came before us, our righteous predecessors, our brothers that came before us. Why are we not doing this stuff when we don't know these companions that gave everything for the religion to get to us? Now, there's a very important... Now, the, again, now what we're going into is narrations, a hadith. A hadith and reports. And... This is to give us an overview, a general understanding. Now we've understood, okay, how do we, as Shia, make a judgment regarding the Sahaba? Like, what is the fundamental thing that makes us have a judgment upon the Sahaba? The Nas. Did they obey the Messenger of Allah or not? That was, that was the main thing. With regards to the Caliphate of Amir al mumini Because you could be upon piety and righteousness, but then you disobeyed on a fundamental thing like wilaya, then, and you rejected it with your actions and beliefs, then you obviously fall into the category of murtad. You're apostated. Simple as that. But again, like I said, you can't, we, as Shia, we can only prove maybe a handful of them fall into that category. Now, Sheikh at Tusi one of our classical scholars, he has a book called Al-Amali. He narrates from his chain from Abdul Rahman bin Abi Layla. 
Now the narration itself is not the most authentic, but there's still an overview. Abdurrahman bin Abi Layla was a tabi'i, so the ones that came um, from the generation after the Sahaba. And some historians say he was present with Imam Ali in the Battle of Jamal. He says, on the day of Jamal, who the fighting? Aisha, Talha, Zubair. So, you imagine, you, you went through all these struggles with these personalities. Talha, Zubair, and then you got the wife of the Prophet, Aisha, that's, you know, been revered, and, you know, especially that she was a, a, a wife of the Prophet at the time. And now, it's like, oh, you're going to war against them. So, on the day of the Jamal, 80, he says, this Tabi, so he was present, or some historians say he was present in the Battle of Jamal. He says, 80 from the people of Badr, so the companions that fought in Badr, and 1,500 companions of the Messenger of Allah witnessed with Ali. That's a huge number. That means there's a huge number that we can say were upon goodness. Or it gives a, a better argument to say um, that a big number of them are revered. Now, there's a there's actually a very important principle that was given by, I was actually shocked when I heard it. Um, it's by the author of Wasa'il al-Shia, Shaykh Hurr al-Amali. Um, he actually has a book called Risala fi Ma'rifat al-Sahaba, which I didn't know about. I was sitting down with one of the scholars and I was like, I kind of just wanted to give him my theory about the Sahaba and my kind of understanding. And he, um, he was like, oh, your, kind of your opinion is more or less close to Shaykh Hur al-Amali. So I was like, oh, really? He's like, yeah, he's like, refer to this book and so on. And I went back. So he actually says, look what Shaykh Hur al-Amali says. He says, and know that most of the names I will mention have no authentication or praise. But whoever there is no dispraise, so has been condemned, or nothing has reached us which obligates us to criticize, and there is no proof for their companionship, and there is proof, sorry, for their companionship, then this is within itself some form of praise. He's saying if, so, if, if we have a companion, we know he's a companion, but nothing, we didn't get anything to show that he is praised or that, um, or that he should be condemned then we'll automatically take it as, as if he's upon goodness because being a companion of Rasulullah would mean you're upon goodness. Now, I, I don't necessarily agree with that specific statement, but it shows how the Shia ulama looked at things. Um, now, there's a really interesting hadith. This hadith has come to us with three different chains, and each... Um, narration is more or less the same hadith but different wording. I'm going to mention all three because I think it's important. He says, so Imam Al-Kulayni, uh, Shaykh Al-Kulayni in his Al-Kafi, he narrates from Imam Al-Baqir who narrates from Amir Al-Mu'mineen. He says, once Amir Al-Mu'mineen prayed the morning prayer with the people in Iraq, after after the prayer, he gave a speech on having fear of Allah. He wept and made people weep. He then said, by Allah, I lived with, a, I lived with people. In the times of my beloved one, the messenger of Allah. So focus on, on, on this point. He says, I lived with people in the times of my beloved one, the messenger of Allah who were ragged, dusty, slim-bellied. Between their eyes, it looked like the hooves of a goat. They spent the night in prostration and in standing position before their Lord, only resting on their feet or forehead. They whispered to their Lord to set their necks free from the fire. And by Allah, I saw them in such condition that they were still afraid and anxious. If you go through our whole hadith corpus, I promise you, you will not find the imams talking about a group of people 
like that, except the prophets, the righteous slaves that came, you know, that were mentioned in the Quran, or the Shias that reached the highest level. You imagine what he's saying. He's saying these people were like monks at night. These people were worshipping day and night. He's talking about the Sahaba. He's given us a general rule when it comes to the Sahaba of Rasulullah. There's also another narration in the same chapter in, uh, by al kulaini from Imam al-Sajjad who says, Once Amir al muminin prayed the morning prayer and remained in his place until the sun rose, up to the length of a spear. Now the first hadith I mentioned is reliable, it was an authentic hadith. This one um, is a weaker one. But look what he says, remained in his place until the sun rose, up to the length of a spear, and then turned his face to the people and said, By Allah, I lived in the times of people who spent the night and the night prostrating and standing before the, their Lord and changing positions only to rest on their knees or forehead, as if they could hear the roaring of fire in their ears. When Allah was mentioned, they, ser they swerved like branches of a tree in, um, in the wind, as if the people had spent the night totally neglectful of worship. Then the narrator says that the imam thereafter was never seen laughing until he passed away. He's talking about Imam Sajjad. So we see here again, more or less the same narration, a general overview of the Sahaba. This is who the Sahaba were. In our hadith corpus, yes, we disagree with certain Sahaba. We condemn certain Sahaba. A small group of them. It's actually not a big group. Once you start to study and look at these different categories that we mentioned by Sheikh Asif Muhsini, most of them wouldn't fall into the category of being condemned. Actually, there's a general overview from these narrations that show us no. They are praised. They are people to be praised. In another hadith, Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Al-Mufid narrates it in his Al-Amali. By the way, Al-Amali, just, um, I really recommend you read it. Uh, we have um, Amali Al-Mufid and Amali Al-Saduq that's been translated. You can find it on Thaqalain app. Um, it's basically the, our classical scholars who will be sitting down. They will say in the beginning of the chapter, on this day, it was a Friday, I don't know, 27th of Rajab, for example, or something along them lines. Um, in Mashhad, um, Abi Ja'far as Saduq narrated this, and then he'll give you the chain. So he's basically sitting, and there's people in the masjid, wherever he is, Nishapur or wherever it is, and he'll be like, he'll, he'll start narrating his chain, going back to the imams or any companion or something like that, and he'll narrate. And it's really nice because, for example, when you go to the chapters about Muharram, you'll get all the narrations that he starts mentioning Muharram because he was narrating all of this stuff in Muharram. I, I really recommend for you to refer back to it. But anyway, he mentions Al-Mufid from his chain, from Abi um, Araka. Abi Araka was a tabi, so the, the generation that came after um, the companions. He says, once I prayed behind Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, the morning prayer, in this mosque of yours. Then after the prayers, he turned to the right and there was a gloom over his face. He stayed that way till the sun rose over the um, long wall of the mosque of yours, which was then not as high as it is now. So the mosque back then, um, by the way, the wall would be like up to here. Um, it wouldn't be very high up. Um, it wasn't like now, you know, nice buildings and so on. So he says, um, then turning to the people, he said, by Allah, the companions of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, endured discomfort on such a night, passing it between prostration and standing for the prayers, as if they heard the roar of the hellfire in their ears. And in the morning, they rose covered with dust and pale, with callous skin, resembling the knees of a goat between their eyes. When Allah was remembered in their presence, they quivered the way a tree shakes on a windy day 
and the tears rolled from their eyes till their clothes were wet. And then he continues with the uh, report that is seen, and then that Amir al Mu'minin rose by saying, By Allah, it seems the people have now become heedless. Thereafter, he, Ali, was not, uh, not seen in a cheerful um, uh, mood till the event at the hands of Ibn Muljam took place. So imagine he's basically saying, Amir al Mu'minin stopped, didn't smile until he was struck by Ibn Muljam because he saw it as victory. SubhanAllah. Anyway, so the narration. These three narrations, different um, chains, slightly different wording, all saying general rule, Sahaba, people of piety, Sahaba, people of righteousness, people that feared Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, in another narration, in Al Kafi again, this is a crucial one. No, sorry, in, in um, Kamil Ziyarat. So, someone comes to. Um, Imam al-Sadiq, and he basically says, um, what, what places should I visit when it comes to when I'm in Medina? So he goes through all of that. I don't want to mention the whole thing. He says, he says go to um, the mosque of Al-Ahzab. Al-Ahzab is where the battle occurred, the battle of Al-Ahzab. He says, he says that the Prophet, the Messenger of Allah stood there when the battle of, uh, of Ahzab was happening, and he said this dua. So Ibn Qulaway, there's a book called Kamil Ziyarat, it's one of our classical sources, he mentions this. Look at the dua of the Messenger of Allah. O support of the anguished ones, O fulfiller of the prayers of the distressed ones, O saviour of the heartbroken ones, relieve me from my grief, my, from my agony, my sadness, for you see my state and the state of my companions. So Rasulullah in Shia book, a classical Shia book, is making dua for his companions. So we're starting to see now there is a general overview that the Sahaba are praised in our books. And by the way, there's so much. I can't even fit it in because the time, uh, we don't have too much time. Otherwise, I, I, I think I could f I found probably about, and, and by the way, it was just a few hours. I found probably about nearly 30 narrations in praise of the Sahaba in our, our books. Um, last one I'll mention, no, last two, sorry, and then we'll get into the Q&A, inshallah. So in a Sahih Hadith, in Al-Kafi, Mansur bin Hazim, he said to Abi Abdullah, Imam al-Sadiq, he said, What is my condition? I ask you about an issue, so you answer me in it with a certain answer. Then some more, someone other than me comes to you, so you answer him, you answer him in, in it with a different answer. So a person will come to Imam al-Sadiq, Imam al-Sadiq will answer in one way. Another person comes five minutes later, he will answer in another way. A different, uh, to the same question. Now, there's, there could be many reasons for this. I don't want to get into it too much. But usually, just from, um, just so you can have a general understanding, sometimes it's because the imam had to do taqiyya, basically uh, protect himself and the Shia, because that person that's asking the question is maybe from the people um, that are non-Shia. Or it's because that specific person, his fiqhi mas'ala, is more um, his the answer is more specific to his um, circumstances, and there could be other reasons as well. But he says, so the Imam said, we answer the people in depth and in brief. So inform me. So he says, listen to these this question. So inform me about the companions of the Messenger of Allah. Were they truthful about Muhammad? Or did they lie? What do you usually hear about the Sahaba of Rasulullah that the Shias believe? That they're all liars. Look what the Imam says. So the guy, so the, <laughs> the guy, the companion, Mansur bin Hazm, he says, so inform me about the companions of the Messenger of Allah. Were they truthful about Muhammad or did they lie? He said they were truthful. 
companion asked a general question about the Sahaba. He didn't say the virtuous ones, the good ones. He said Sahaba. And look what he says. He says, they were truthful. So I said, what was the matter with them that they differed? So why was the contra uh, ahadith contradicting each other? From the com one companion says, Rasulullah said this, the other companion says this, and they contradict each other. He says, so the imam says, don't you know that a man used to come to the messenger of Allah and ask him about a thing? So he answers him in it with an answer. Then he answers him after that with that which uh, abrogates the former answer. So they basically, the other one gets abrogated, the other uh, hadith gets taken over. So that's why. Now, Sheikh Asif Muhsini, when he actually explains this hadith, he says that this rawaya, it could be said, he says, that he's talking about when the narrations contradict. It's not because one group was lying and the other. No, they were both truthful, but one of them heard at a certain time. This one got abrogated, so he didn't hear it. So it's talking about a hadith that differ. Usually the imams, alayhum salam they give us certain principles on to how to interact with a hadith and derive ahkam from a hadith that contradict. This is one of them. Is that you need to see if something got abrogated. For example, um, you see Sunnis, they have this opinion that mut'a got abrogated. I mean, I think a Shafi'i says, was it? Like, I think so. He says something like 10, over 10 times or something like that, eight times. Uh, anyway, a, a big number. I can't remember the exact uh, figure, but he basically got abrogated, then became halal, then abrogated, then. And that's what he says about muta'a. Actually, we have in our books also where it says, Imam, uh, it's narrated from Imam Ali, from Rasulullah, where Rasulullah basically um, gives a ruling that muta'a is halal in the, battle of, uh, in the time of the Battle of Khaybar. Huh? Oh, halal, haram, sorry. So, haram. He basically uh, made it forbidden. Okay? So, um, now, obviously, Shah is like, what do you mean? Uh, I thought it was halal. No. So, what he's saying is, is, the, is some of the scholars, so one of my teachers, he actually believes that, yeah, it got abrogated at that time, then became halal again. Obviously, as, as, is, as is clear from the imams alayhum salam that they made it halal later on so um, I'll quickly I don't want to because I don't want to take up your time and uh, I don't want to bore you with so many ahadith but there was a there, um, there's a sahih hadith in Al-Kafi basically someone comes to discuss um, um, Abi Hanifa with Imam Al-Kadhim about, you know, because he used to, um, what Abi Hanifa used to do, um, he used to use an analogy, yeah, to basically derive qiyas, yeah, to derive ahkam. Um, and what, um, obviously the imams were completely against them, uh, against such way of deriving ahkam. So Imam al kadhim basically says, he says to this, and, uh, you know, if there's any Hanafis, maybe close your ears here, but he says, Imam al kadhim says, May Allah curse Abu Hanifa. He used to say, Ali said, but I say. And the companion said, but I say. What am I trying to get to? I'm trying to get to the fact that Imam al kadhim had a problem with Abu Hanifa because he used to say, Ali said and I say. But did he stop there? No, he said, and the companion said, and I say. So he's saying the words of the companions of Rasulullah are a hujjah also. You can't disrespect the words of the, the companions of Rasulullah by saying, oh, you know, like the older generation, our community, oh, they're sahaba. No, the words is a hujjah. Of course, it's a hujjah. As long as it's in line with the words of the Imams, alayhum salam. But generally speaking, their words is a hujjah. And the Imam al-Kawf didn't just say Imam Ali. No, he said, the companion said, but I say. So he had a problem with Abi Hanifa saying that. So just finally, the last one, and this gives us the complete overview of our understanding of the Sahaba in the Shia Hadith Corpus. Um, As-Saduq narrates in Uyun Akbar al He actually narrates it 
with three different chains. Now, by the standard of some scholars like Sheikh Asif Muhsinin, he will consider this authentic. All three chains are weak. But um, there's also another problem with the actual hadith. is It's a lengthy hadith, but there are certain problems with um, some statements that's attributed to the imam um, that contradict other authentic ruayat. And it states that Al-Fadl bin Shadhan, who's a companion of Al-Hadi and Al-Askari, narrated from Imam Al-Rada. Now, this, this is actually a letter. So Al-Ma'moon asked Imam Ali bin Musa Al-Rada to write a brief account of the pure Islam for him. It's a very lengthy hadith. Now, it could be said that Al-Fadl bin Shadhan maybe got his hands on the letter Allah Al-Alam. Anyway, it says, the belief in the dissociation of those who oppressed the members of the household of Muhammad, especially those who forced them out of their homes, began oppressing them and changed the traditions established by their Prophet. He's talking about the Sahaba. It is obligatory to dissociate from those who breached their covenant like al-Nakithin, al-Qasitin, and al-Mariqin, and those who dishonored the veil of God's Prophet by breaking their covenant of their Imam, by bringing out that lady, so he's talking about Aja, and started to fight with the commander of the faithful, killed the pious Shias, may God have mercy upon them. It is also obligatory to dissociate from, dissociate from those who denounce the good companions, and deported them, and those who dishonored them, who had abandoned God's prophet, distributed government funds among the rich, and put the fools in charge of the Muslim, um, the Muslims' affairs, such as Muawiyah and Amr bin al-As, he's talking about Uthman bin Affan, who were both downed by God's prophet, and the dissociation from those, from their followers, who fought the commander of the faithful, and killed the Ansar and Muhajireen. So he's saying we need to do bara'a, tabarri, from those companions that came and killed the Muhajireen and Ansar. And then he continues to say, and the people of merit and the righteous that came after them. So as it is also obligatory to dissociate from the people of disobedience and dissociate from Abi, um, Abi Musa al-Ash'ari, another companion that we basically condemn. And those of his friends, those whose efforts have been wasted in this life, while they, were, they thought that they were acquiring good by their works. And then he continues, and then he starts to mention the companions that are revered. He mentions about, um, about eight of them, or ten of them. And then he goes and their likes. So anyone that was upon goodness. So here we just have an overview of the companions of Rasulullah in Shia thought. In Shia and the Shia hadith corpus. Like I mentioned, this is not to say we do not condemn a certain group of the companions. This is to say that we have a general belief that majority of the Sahaba of Rasulullah, a very high percentage of them were upon goodness. They were people of piety and taqwa and people that loved Allah and his messenger. So inshallah, you benefited from today's uh, lecture. Uh, forgive me if I went on for too long. And uh, inshallah, may Allah raise us among the righteous companions of Rasulullah and make us of those that um, stay obedient to Allah and His Messenger. Hada wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa ahli bayti al-tayyibin al-tahirin.